<coughs> Just out of curiosity, how many out of honors are here? How many first first timers? Are Quite a few. Uh, I, I think Anthony talked about the importance of sustainability and uh, the role that tall buildings play in, in making urban places sustainable. I think you learn, and some of you who are new here, as you're more about travel, that's one of the uh, critical issues, issues that we are addressing in the urban environment. One of the uh, uh, most sustainable thing, one of the most sustainable uh, acts we can take is to densify our cities. And as, the, as that chart showed, is probably the most important uh, thing about green uh, urban design and, and, and sustainability. What I'm going to talk about is the, what, where Chicago is going from a, see, from a policy perspective as it relates to all buildings that really not the objects of all building, but its place in the urban context. And I'll talk about some of the work that we're doing comparing with other cities that we've worked in, collaborating with a number of other similar cities and learn from each other. Not every uh, policy translates correctly. No single city does a good urban policy, but uh, all buildings were about sustainability or about the urban environment, but there are applicable lessons that we learn from different cities. Chicago, as we all know, most of you know, is known for its architecture and uh, partly because of its history and the last 100, 150 years. Uh, of all the giants practice here uh, from the, uh, uh, architects and specifically the Bar and Jenny invented the first skyscraper. Since in the last over 100 years, in all the significant buildings that kind of set the precedent to uh, fall buildings were built here, from the uh, Tribune competition all the way to uh, Sears Tower. Well, a few years ago, I mean, that actually began to define Chicago as a city that's sculpted by the design of the fall building primarily. Unlike San Francisco or Vancouver, where the national environment defines the city. Well, September 11th uh, put a, a slight, a tiny kink in that in terms of how cities view uh, tall buildings. But Chicago hasn't changed its mind. In fact, immediately after that, the city came up and said, we will continue to build tall buildings. And that act is not going to change the direction for the city. So, what we are concentrating on as it relates to tall building is our downtown central uh, loop area where uh, we don't have a height limit. The height is determined, defined by uh, what you can build, what's allowed by zoning FAR. Within the uh, downtown area, a number of uh, new policies that have taken place include the new zoning ordinance uh, that took uh, effect in 2004 that really look at addressing some of the sustainability issues as it relates to a mix of uses within the downtown area. And then through policy, we have been actively working in the last three, four years, focusing on what the role of tall buildings should be within the downtown area. Here is a, a, a plan by Skidmore that was done with the city that projected how the city would grow over the next 20 years. Blue shows what was expected as, uh, uh, for the next 20 years. This was about four or five years ago. We are, are rethinking that as now because a lot of changes have taken place. Some uh, because of the sustainability issue and others because of some of the uh, public spaces and uh, public investments that we have done in the city that we have to rethink what was projected then and in fact go higher where it makes sense. Place in the taller buildings where it makes sense. Before we do that, before we densify the downtown even more, uh, we need to address some of the issues Anthony raised, which is how do we make our uh, urban places livable? Well, parks are really important to attract families to come uh, to live in the downtown area. We're actively doing that by transforming uh, abundant lots or uh, asphalt into open space. The Chicago River uh, within the downtown area we're working actively to convert that into a public space, uh, trail, walking, and in fact, waiting the water, 
uh, so that people can enjoy uh, and live near the river, near downtown. Number of uh, uh, bold steps as well. Uh, former mixed field uh, is turned into now an open space for the public, and, uh, where uh, native plants are taken. A few years ago, five years ago, this is what the Canadian Park looked look like. For those of you who haven't been here, this is the sea of parking, 30 feet, 30 meters below Michigan Avenue. That is now one of the largest green roofs in the world, 24 acres uh, at the Canadian Park, where thousands of people are uh, walking there and enjoying uh, the wonderful amenity. It's amazing to see kids, uh, hundreds of thousands of kids in the summer, play uh, and actually scream about 9 o'clock, 10 o'clock in the parents are driving away. That, those are the kinds of amenities that I think we need to bring as a city to help encourage uh, the quality of life uh, in the downtown area and to encourage uh, the density that we want within the downtown. Because of a lot of those investments that have taken place, we're, we're looking at what our full building strategy, strategy should be as we move forward. And we're looking at examples from other cities. We're working constantly with how other cities dealt with. Let's just go through quickly about San Francisco, a city that I lived in for 12 years. We were dealing with the same issues in the late 90s, uh, where a significant part of a south of market, just right here in the financial district, uh, opened up as a result of the Loma Prieta earthquake in 1989. And San Francisco was facing a significant shortage in housing, and the city didn't have a culture of building or living in the downtown area. We took a, 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 a policy approach for the uh, Better Neighborhoods 2002 to really think about increasing density in the downtown area and do it in the back of transit. Uh, that white bar you see in the back is Transway Terminal, 26 different bus systems from the region come uh, to that uh, terminal. A $2.6 billion investment was anticipated to build that. Well, in order to capture the return from the land that opened up, we needed to look at how that area gets developed. But first we have to overcome uh, the uh, aversion to tall buildings especially in San Francisco because of the history of the 1950s, the great progress through redevelopment agency, uh, which actually took this is a great diagram. What you see underneath is in the Fillmore, it's very fine grained uh, Victorians were considered a paid blind. And progress was object buildings in the sea of uh, parking lot. They show green here what was built there in the sea of asphalt, where you have object buildings. And then buildings like this, Montana Towers, right by the lake, they cap wide blocking views. Uh, the citizens reacted against them. And that individual buildings that really have really no respect to their neighbors, uh, San Francisco has actually uh, revolted, and that was part of the reason that they did the 1975 general plan and the 1985 urban design guideline. The idea is they like our food. How do we? harmonize all the mix and density within the downtown area. So we did a number of analysis and study, studied the blocks and determined you know, what is the appropriate placement of all buildings within a block. We looked at Vancouver and other models. You, know, you did two blocks, two towers. What you see in red are uh, towers uh, staggered as a checkerboard. What you see, the numbers you take and what the height is for each building. So we tested a number of ideas. And also how you shape the uh, urban uh, form, and then tested those each of those ideas from different parts of the city. One tower per block, one downtown hill, as you come from the Bay Bridge, what is a uh, checkerboard pattern uh, look like versus one tower per block. And this is to take the citizens to go through the process of it. They can understand complex uh, urban form issues uh, policy decisions in a way uh, that lay people can understand. One power per block actually looks better because there's light and air, but it also brings you almost uh, half the return to build the uh, $2.6 billion uh, transit improvement. So policymakers have to make a decision based on what is advantageous for the city. 
based on a number of analysis, light and air, uh, uh, we started rethinking about the 1985 guidelines for uh, buildings in San Francisco. This is uh, a famous wedding cake uh, form that dictated how buildings, all buildings should be built. What resulted from those was mostly mediocre buildings that are bad, short, that they avoid going forward because the process that uh, the public process always cuts the height back, but also architects and developers who rather, instead of stepping their buildings, especially uh, residential, where it doesn't make sense, they just minimize the height and then build a bulky building. So we started thinking about, well, the tall is not really bad. What's bad is bad design. So if you have the same number of units, just exclude them. We started asking lay people. What would you rather have? Sky, light, air coming up the street, and one versus the other. We looked at buildings that were built per previous code, just said simple Photoshop, light and air the streets, start to the not really that. So, based on that and a number of other analysis, we changed the guidelines. We figured out how much power spacing we should have on the power, how the power should be formed in terms of height uh, differentiation. Based on that, we were able to increase a significant amount of density within the uh, downtown area and also great uh, living uh, and working in the mixed use within the Trans Bay area. Some of the buildings have been parked, some of the portal fence. In fact, you felt yesterday this is under construction. If it was done in the previous court, uh, that's a short stuff building, but it would have ended up the city. In fact, the city has gone even further now with our uh, relationship back and forth where policymakers like to come to Chicago and we go there. They're actually even going higher, <coughs> beginning to look a little bit like Chicago. And when I was there, 800 feet was a big, huge, huge step to have a couple of places set uh, zone 800 feet. Now they're looking at about 1,200 uh, feet. We looked at Vancouver, uh, probably one of the best models from control perspective. And not every city has uh, significant control. Where they looked at view corridors as a way to dictate where all the things go. In other words, they did the important view corridors and they say, these are the areas that we can build. Based on that and based on different uh, urban forms, they make the determination what direction they wanted to go. In fact, they did a survey uh, of citizens to understand uh, what they want. Just out of curiosity, and I have a straw hand like the dome that, that has an urban form. How many people would like that as a city park? <coughs> One, two, three, four. What about the bottom middle of the landmark? Very good. It's interesting. In, in uh, Vancouver, uh, they, there was a significant difference. Uh, a lot of women actually liked the dome, and men liked the landmark. It was an actual survey that they did. That, through that process, they actually determine you know, what and how the urban form should be shaped. Uh, the idea of the mountains and the natural environment is important. Uh, and located buildings and areas that uh, uh, prescribe heights based on those analysis. Power separation, four plates uh, reduction. It's amazing. They do it up 6,500 square feet for four plates, 8,500 square feet in the maximum that they go. Uh, our separation was uh, significant. Uh, again, to bring that again. Uh, the sustainability, community sustainability, or uh, 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 policy that they have that the urban place, especially at the street level, is critical. That it becomes uh, desert friendly, active, mix of uses, and some extraction from developments that the schools should come first, grocery stores, and other library. Quality of life is that integrates with tall buildings to make a sustainable community. So, with those kinds of exchanges in the last uh, four years or so, we've been focusing on how we should grow as we move south. What you see on the right is the north part of the city, Grand Park, and the foreground. From that uh, Google map, you could see how 
with right at the center left, the, the, the site is weak, buildings are weak. So we said we need to continue uh, placing buildings where they make sense, appropriate heights where they make sense to, to start training uh, ground cover. So we developed a policy that where we place our tall buildings should be where we should frame and have access to significant natural features, ground park, the river, the lake, and any major new park that is built around that, we frame those uh, natural amenities for a couple of reasons. One is just formalistically, it, it works better. The other is to have maximum access to public uh, and natural features to as many people uh, as possible. To say this all and slender is probably better than short and fat. Chicago has had that tradition uh, for some time that some of the buildings actually, because we don't have that control, uh, such as that gray building that you see. I was very screwed with that. If you get closer, if you haven't seen that, you go one uh, by by um, or Michigan Avenue, you can see how big that building is and it really blocks views. Yes, a lot of status. So based on that, we started discussing with developers and architects to really place their buildings and height where they make sense. And these are the types of developments that we are encouraging and, and helping frame and run part of uh, this uh, area photo uh, done by Papa George Haynes and it begins to describe the direction we're going, at least in the framing of that ground park. Some of the blue uh, buildings are currently in the process of approval or have been approved as uh, the types of buildings that we encourage. So the idea of green is an important part of that as well, that we challenge uh, developers and architects to green their buildings. And I've uh, also work to find the city's skyline. I live in a high rise, I don't live in a high rise. So, so that's the view of the window. How does winter? <laughs> that's what it looks like in the winter. And, uh, sometimes I can test this for the day before we tell us how because what is going to look like for my and, uh, The city has challenged private architects, I mean, uh, the private sector architects and developers by leading by example. Sustainability is one of the uh, high priorities for the city. Did it by uh, initially setting example, built green roof by City Hall, uh, decided that every city building has to be built uh, according to LEED standard. It worked for us, it's saving us a significant amount of money, then it started asking the private sector. City Hall worked uh, saving thousands of dollars a month on heating and cooling bills just because of the green roof. 70% of uh, the one inch stormwater is retained rather than going into our infrastructure because we have a combined sewer and water system. And we have a lot of rain and floods uh, in the flood and the sewer gets streams into the uh, lake like this kind of rainy water. So when, uh, when we're on a tall building with the mayor, he looks down and he says, oh, so much real estate on those tall buildings. Why don't we do Green hills. We have about 3 million square foot of green hills city now, more than any city in the country. We also encourage buildings to be green with incentives and legislation as well. Incentives with a permit process now that favors uh, if you build green, you give you a permit faster than if you're not. Uh, so, by setting example and also uh, legislation, we're encouraging uh, people especially tall buildings, which is the challenge to be green. Again, at the street level, uh, the new zoning ordinance defined the number of street, streets in the downtown area to be pedestrian streets. That restricts parapets, blank walls, and requires a mix of uses at the street level to have that kind of social or community sustainability at the street level. Instead of having blank walls and parking, we encourage them to require you to have uh, a more active space. So I hope that gives you a good direction, a good direction, a good glimpse into the direction.